Hello, pharmacists and friends. Today is December 4th, 2023, and welcome to The Regiment, where public health pharmacists, pharmacy students, and our guests discuss the latest public health issues. Listen in to find out how pharmacists and pharmacy students like me can improve population health, health equity, and patient care through advocacy and education. My name is Elisa Perino, and I'm a final year pharmacy student at the University of Rhode Island, working with the Rhode Island Department of Health alongside my professor, Dr. Bratberg. And I'm Jeff Bratberg. I'm a clinical professor of pharmacy practice and clinical research at the College of Pharmacy and the Academic Collaborations Officer at the Rhode Island Department of Health. As a reminder to our listeners, the opinions expressed in the podcast by the hosts and guests do not represent the opinions of the United States government, the Rhode Island Department of Health, nor the University of Rhode Island. And today we're going to be talking about pharmacy-based methadone access, and we are joined by an incredible guest, Aaron Ferguson, who I will let Dr. Bratberg introduce. And I know Aaron can uh, introduce himself, but I just want to give him lots of kudos for joining us finally. I think we started this conversation again on the podcast in about about May or June with my previous students. And so uh, I was very pleased to meet him in person after some other Zoom meetings uh, at the Liberating Methadone meeting. And I saw Aaron was a key speaker at uh, a meeting um, on expanding methadone access. Um, He'll tell you all about his podcast that everyone should smash that subscribe button to. Uh, and if you really want to know more about what people who use methadone think about methadone, uh, look up, I believe it's public, the Methadone Manifesto. So I realize it's one of the best things I've read and actually is now also in a peer reviewed in form um, for, for academics like me. But I think it's more important to think about um, access to care. But Saul, so Aaron, tell us about yourself and what you do. Yeah, thanks so much, Jeff, and thank you, thanks to you both of you for having me on here. Um, you know, always welcome an opportunity to talk about these issues, and I appreciate you and your team focusing on them. I think that there is a lot of gravitas right now when it comes to access to methadone. Our culture is seeming to wake up to the reality that this is an answer that's been sitting around for quite some time, and could be saving a lot more lives than it currently is. Now, with that said, I will say, you know, we're not fully awake to that reality, but most of those of us who care about evidence and are involved in medicine are beginning to acknowledge some of these barriers. So I appreciate the opportunity to discuss them, and thank you for focusing on this topic today. Um, I'll start by saying I'm somebody who has lived experience of being on both methadone and buprenorphine, been in and out of treatment. I've been a person who's used drugs for most of my life. And using drugs saved my life. I was traumatized a lot as a kid growing up in a religious cult um, called the Children of God. And I was trafficked as a child. And I escaped that and grew up on the streets of California. And so using illicit drugs and criminalized drugs was my go-to. And it's how I kept from committing suicide um, or even getting into worse trouble. So I view drug use as a coping strategy that can work depending on the con uh, the context. However, uh, the lack of chaos that accompanies being on a medication like methadone or buprenorphine is something that's, I believe, to be beneficial. It was beneficial to me, uh, saved my life, and uh, I hope to be able to contribute to a conversation about and actions that will extend that same opportunity to others at whatever level they may be struggling with. I am on the leadership team of the National Survivors Union, which is the National Drug Users Union. So there is a group of people who uh, become what is called drug user activists or advocates that advocate not necessarily for substance use per se, but for the treatment of people who use drugs uh, at, as human beings, whether or not they use substances and regardless of what is put in one's body. And for the abolition of the war on substances that disproportionately affects black, brown, and poor people and has for a very long time. And so we're active in that regard and try to fight stigma by saying we're people who use drugs instead of only decrying drug use in our conversations about the, uh, the topic. And methadone and buprenorphine are often seen as steps toward what we call a safe supply. Um, there's the idea that the reason why so many people are dying is because of a contaminated and dangerous illicit drug supply. 
And as long as that is the case, we believe that we can do everything we can to try and stamp out the supply of drugs or to try and hamper the ability for people to get them, but we'll continue to have a very dangerous climate. So a lot of my work focuses on trying to rethink and revamp and rehash and re reimagine the regulations around methadone and try to find ways to get people into treatment uh, because most people are not. Now, the data is showing about 70 to 80% of people who would benefit from being on methadone are not on it. People who would technically what they call meet the criteria for an opioid use disorder are not in treatment. And a lot of folks leave treatment. Treatment has very low retention. It's about 40% across the board. So people are not staying on methadone and they're not getting on methadone. And a lot of us know why that is. Um, a lot of There's a lot of evidence around that. And you know we can discuss some of that today. Um, I'm just happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing that with us. Um, I'm going to provide just a little bit of background um, before we get into our conversation. So methadone is a medication that's been used successfully, safely, and effectively for decades in the treatment of opioid use disorder or, or OUD. Um, methadone's once daily dosing and reduction of opioid withdrawal symptoms and cravings has made it wildly successful in stabilizing the lives of individuals living with opioid use disorder. And currently in the United States, methadone prescribing is limited to opioid treatment programs or OTPs or methadone clinics, um, typically requiring counseling, frequent urine drug tests, and transportation to these clinics every day um, for the daily dose. Um, these are major access limitations and due for change. So today we're talking about expanding that access and specifically pharmacy-based methadone access in the United States. So um, we talked a little bit about it already, but uh, we know when methadone is, um, it's monumental in helping stabilize the lives of people living with OUD, yet we aren't seeing it utilized to its full potential. Um, Aaron, would you share your opinion on some of the biggest barriers existing to methadone right now? Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. It is become pretty clearly the case that we have this system that hasn't changed very much in the last 50 to 60 years. And so many of those things became so clearly evident, actually, as a result of the COVID-19 virus. And the reason for that is because the regulations had to be relaxed in order to prevent the spread of the virus. And the CDC uh, was implementing measures to prevent the spread of the virus that the clinics then had to implement. And we would not have seen the types of research and types of changes to the regulation that took place during that period if uh, that had not happened. There's a funny phrase that we all have is that it you know, took a pandemic to get a take home. Take homes are what we call medication that people get to take without being at the clinic. And so it took a pandemic to get a take home. And that's kind of what happened. And COVID-19 created these conditions under which research could be conducted on the effect of giving people methadone to take home and not having them come into the clinic every day. And by and large, none of the fears that drove the stringency of the regulations that currently exist were realized. So we didn't have widespread overdoses as a result of what is called diversion, which means selling a medication or giving a medication to someone else who it was not prescribed to. We didn't have a massive issue with that, and we didn't have massive widespread rates of overdose. What we did see was that people got to a stable dose quicker and that people were retained in treatment longer and better because they were not having to miss days as a result of the requirement to come into the clinic daily. Urine, urine uh, toxicology, so the requirement, the mandate to submit a urine drug screen in order to remain in treatment was lifted and that had a positive net positive effect. It's important to note that that is a practice that has no evidence supporting it. So there's never been a, a research study showing that urine drug screening is beneficial to methadone treatment. It's just one of the long list of things that has just been implemented as a result of cultural attitudes. And so there were conditions that emerged and activism that emerged. The group of folks that I work with, the National Survivors Union, became involved in sign-on letters and became involved in 
some activism around rethinking the regulations and saying, here's what we as patients, here's what we as people with lived experience really need from treatment, and here's where it's failing us. And, and when I say failing us, I'm referring to the stadium full of people that's dying every year right now. You know, we're looking at 109,000, 110,000, uh, probably a lot more than that, even that's dying from opioid poisoning. Most people will be related, familiar with the conversation related to that. And so there have been changes, there has been research, and the evidence is in front of us. Uh, so now the discussion should be about how to proceed and how to make methanol more available. And we have landed on pharmacies because this is something that a lot of countries have already been doing for a very long time. So it's not a new idea that methadone would be in pharmacies. So I hope that addresses somewhat of your question. And I'll, I'll add a, that's, thank you so much for that summary. And we're going to definitely talk about how anyone listening can be an advocate because everyone can join this cause. I think they should. We need to do a better job at treating healthcare, and, and we should honestly, in my opinion, start with um, addiction care or, or substance use care. But I think it's interesting that for our listeners too, and I've written about this, that pharmacies were dispensing methadone in the late 60s in Texas, actually, for, where you are right now, um, before the rules changed. And the National Pharmacy Association, the American Pharmacy Association, actually challenged the law in federal court and won in the early 70s saying we have methadone why you can't pick one drug we have all these other controlled substances that you declared controlled substances but not methadone you can't change the rules they actually won in an appellate court but what they couldn't do is force the fda to change their regs saying okay you can have methadone for treating pain some folks get methadone pills to treat pain but you can't have methadone for oud in pharmacies so it's not just changing federal law it's literally Pharmacists actually stood up and said, no, 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 you can't, you can't do this. And so our point is to be, to join with you and your group and anyone else, a large group of folks, uh, judging by the Liberating Methadone Conference to, to all, all work to advocate for, to fix the glitch. <laughs> it's a pretty big glitch when you talk about hundreds of thousands of folks dying every year unnecessarily. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that what gets undercounted in the conversation about why we should keep methadone under lock and key and why we should control it is just that it's the risks and detriments of not treating so this is something that we always think about in medicine we always take into account when we're deciding whether to prescribe a drug, whether to dispense a drug, how available to make it, we're asking ourselves what are the costs and benefits so every medication, as we all know, comes with the list of side effects. And we are willing to stomach a great deal of risk if the treatment saves one's life. And we can think of a lot of examples where that's the case. There are a lot of surgeries that are incredibly risky. There are a lot of medications that come with unintended consequences. But we decide that all things considered, we are talking about the greatest good for the greatest number. And... Um, we make a decision, we proceed with a probabilistic expectation with that. For some reason, methadone has found a way to sidestep that conversation, and we need to be asking ourselves why, if people's lives are at stake, uh, why we're not applying the same logic that we do to every other aspect of medicine that we would to methadone. Um, so we kind of touched on this a little bit already. Um, but as far as like stigma, criminalization, and drug policy, they play an outsized role in the way that drug users are treated and overall, as well as in the healthcare system. Um, so how has this played a role in limiting methadone access? Yeah, and when we say the word stigma, I think it's something that can be hard to measure. You know, if, if we care about science and evidence and medicine and all of these things that we tend to take for granted and other types of healthcare, care, um, we're going to say things like stigma. We need to know what that means and we need to know what it looks like. Um, and so the best way to tell what something means in a scientific way is to say, what does it look like? So how does it translate into actual behavior and the behavior associated with methadone and, and people who deliver methadone is one that is punitive. And people on methadone are monitored 
more closely than even a person who is on parole for murder. It is harder to get methadone than it is to get a, a lethal weapon that could kill an entire building of people. We're talking about the most regulated drug in the world. And it isn't, according to the research, because of how dangerous the substance is. If you open the bottle, it's not going to fill the room and kill everyone in it. Um, it's because of the people that are taking the drug, right? That's the independent variable. We can't find another variable that would explain why this has to be controlled to the extent that it is. Now, that's that's where we diverge uh, with folks that think that the system as it currently stands is effective because there is a, quite a strong lobby that would say that and would claim that doctors won't prescribe the medication, that patients can't be trusted with it, um, or that by and large, there are special conditions that only clinics can address, that only addiction medicine doctors can address, and that only dispensing through a pharmacy can deal with that we need to take into account. And that's those are some of the things that we are grappling with as a nation and that the public conversation is beginning to take a look at. And it's definitely clear that there's a need for change um, right now. And one proposed solution is expanding that to the access to pharmacies, um, which has several advantages. We kind of touched on this already, but, um, you know, convenient locations, extended hours, um, and existing DEA registration. What are your thoughts on how this expansion could improve um, the current situation? Yeah, I think that if we look, there have been studies that looked at, for instance, the proximity of pharmacies to areas and rates of people with opioid use disorder. And it's important to note what we're talking about when we talk about an opioid use disorder. We're talking about a person meeting a number of conditions that impede social functioning. So there are like about six or seven conditions that a person has to meet in the DSM-5 in order to have an opioid use disorder. And so there's a lot of folks who meet those conditions. And I would wager that, and I would argue that even people who are using opioids in a recreational fashion would tend to meet a lot of those conditions just because they're engaging with a criminalized behavior. And so if you're at risk of overdose and you're at risk of being criminalized um, and punished for engaging with this type of substance, then you need access to something that's not going to kill you and it's not going to wind you up in jail or prison or losing your kids or your family or any of the other social detriments associated with criminalized drug use. And a lot of people who have succeeded with methadone for a very long time will point out those as the reasons why people actually seek treatment. So people don't seek treatment necessarily because they want recovery per se. Um, they just are tired of all of the things that accompany criminalized drug use. And so the problem here by and large is how hard it is to get on methadone, how hard it is to get to a clinic. And there's a lot of, I mean, it follows logic that pharmacies are going to be closer to people and that people are not going to have to go as far. But I think there's a broader conversation to be had here about breaking this drug, this medication into the broader context of healthcare. And there are a lot of people who would push back against that and say, well, there's so much stigma as it stands. Um, buprenorphine has been somewhat deregulated and not a lot more doctors are prescribing it not as much as we would like. And if we put methadone, for instance, in primary care and allow it to be picked up at the pharmacy, A, docs aren't going to want to treat people, um, you know, and, and B, um, this is not a type of treatment that they're prepared to deliver or are capable of delivering and that or that pharmacy, that pharmacists and pharmacies are capable of dispensing. There's certain conditions that need to be taken into account, fentanyl use and all of these different co-occurring comorbidities and different factors that people present with. Now, let's just uh, think about that. Let's step back and think about that for a minute. You know, let's say we do put methadone in broader healthcare and we do face some of those issues. Okay, so there is stigma. We've mentioned stigma against people who use drugs, which really is equates to actions and differential treatment. So do people who use drugs get treated differently than other people in healthcare settings? And we know that that's the case. But to me, the real question is around how do we change that? Um, and do we change it by keeping it in a side as a side project in healthcare? 
Uh, do we fight stigma by confirming the bias that people who use drugs need a special set of conditions and a special type of treatment in a special place and can't be treated in the same context as any other health condition? Uh, or are we going to start to challenge that uh, through asking general care and asking general pharmacists to begin to engage with people who use drugs? Um, I'm of the viewpoint that fighting stigma requires things to be out in the open. It, won't, it, it will not tolerate us pretending like things are not as common as they are. And this is evident in conversations about things like mental health. You know, it used to be a lot more stigmatized for a person to say they had bipolar or ADHD. And now it's become a lot less stigmatized. And the reason for that is because people have come out as living with those conditions, being on the spectrum. There are a lot of different things that are becoming much more normalized because people are coming out and saying, this is something that I'm living with. And so it's not something that's in the background that we can then vilify and sort of marginalize. It's something we have to grapple with as part of the human condition. So the strongest argument for me of putting methadone in pharmacies and in general health care is sort of forcing a conversation about normalizing substance use and normalizing the need for health care for people who use substances. Yeah, I think that's just extraordinarily well said, Aaron. Really appreciate sharing that perspective that you know, I teach uh, actually tonight, I teach another uh, another session of my opioid use disorder class. And all we do is talk about stigma and discrimination and how people who use drugs are treated differentially and, and really just differential treatment of people in the healthcare system in general. And when you add the criminalization element or if a person identifies as BIPOC or a sexual or gender minority, which occur more frequently among people who use drugs. Now you've just got this intersectionality of really, really, really poor treatment that has long lasting effects on them and their communities and their families. Um, and I think I hear what you're saying about, so if we give people permission, will they prescribe methadone? Cause they aren't doing it for buprenorphine. I hear you. And I think what I hear from pharmacists too, and we'll hear about what happens in other countries and your impression on that. But one of the things that I'm advocating for is Yes, please, please, please have methadone accessible in pharmacies. We need to figure out stocking later, but we really need to figure out paying pharmacies to do that. So pharmacies vaccinated half the country against COVID-19. Some percentage of them didn't believe in vaccination, if you can believe that, right? Um, and so it's interesting how, you know, you can, or, or people who were mandated to get vaccination, and that's a whole other conversation, but there's resistance to sort of care of others among all healthcare workers, pharmacists included. But if you provide a financial incentive, <laughs> you know, um, that's going to be cost savings, regard, you know, absolutely. Um, I, that has to be part of that regulatory change. I don't know if you have a follow up thought on that. Absolutely. I'm glad, I'm glad that you brought up the, the incentives conversation because I do believe that a lot of the incentive structure around methadone is somewhat perverse. Uh, when you're looking at a decreased incentive for giving take-home medication, for instance, or when you're looking at um, an increased incentive for tacking other mandatory services onto methadone that haven't been substantiated as benefiting, benefiting patients or improving treatment outcomes. Those are all things that need to be addressed. We need to know if we're going to lean on a particular intervention, if we're going to lean on a particular way of doing things in healthcare, whether it works or not. And we need to care whether it works or not. And when we create incentives that sort of militate or mitigate against that, it can be really hard to ask those questions. And so, and 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 we know that people operate on the basis of incentives and disincentives. You know, we live in a capitalist system in which the market has conditions, and we have an economy that relies heavily on uh, incentives and disincentives. And so not only do people have a disincentive to treat people who use drugs on the basis of stigma, but if we create other financial barriers and reasons, regulatory reasons not to do that, I like to say that people will say where there is smoke, there's fire. And that's something that runs deep in our psychology is that we believe, well, if things are a certain way, they must be for a reason. And that's how we rationalize. It's part of our fundamental psychology to rationalize things as they are because it's ease of cognition. It's easier to do that. It's easier to come up with a reason why things are the way they are than to challenge them and try to change them and make them better. 
So where there's smoke, there's fire is what people say when they look at the regulations, when they look at the incentives as they currently stand. Now, you mentioned the vaccines and you mentioned our approach there, thereby. I think that we can learn a lot from that. If we took a similar attitude, if we took, took a similar sense of urgency to the people that are dying from opioids, I think that we could save a lot of lives. It's projected that around uh, half a million uh, to a million Americans are going to die in the next um, you know, five years or so. I mean, before the end of the before the end of this decade, we're probably going to lose as many people as we lost from COVID, from from opioid overdose. And let's just say that everyone listening today has their finger on a button that could cut that number in half. And are we going to push it or not? Are we going to allow our fears of people who use drugs and some of the past ideas that have been proven not to work to to hinder that uh, ability to save lives? So we've been talking about um, methadone in the United States, but um, other countries like Australia, um, Canada, and the United Kingdom already allow the physician prescribing and community pharmacy dispensing of methadone. And in the U.S., we already stock pharmacies, as Dr. Bradbrook said earlier, um, to dispense methadone tablets for pain. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Should we be modeling after these countries? I think so. I think there's a tendency to have an attitude of exceptionalism, um, especially when it comes to healthcare. For some reason, in the United States, we have these, these massive expenditures. And don't get me wrong, the U.S. has some pretty amazing healthcare. We have some some fantastic innovation. Um, science has been able to give us tools uh, that otherwise would be absent. We have had some really smart people, some really great thinkers in American medicine. Uh, however, I think we've all come to realize that there are some real uh, uh, detriments and real hindrances in, in access, in the quality of care, and just in application across the board. And when I talk to people about methadone in other countries and the way it's delivered in pharmacies and has been for a very long time, people who are opponents of that model in the United States seem to often reach for what's what feel like special pleading arguments, which is well, the U.S. is somehow fundamentally different, and here's why our situation is special. And those are rarely substantiated. Those are usually reaches uh, as far as logic goes. And unless there is some fundamental genetic difference that would account for these profound differences that we could expect to see between the United States and other countries, we can expect to see lower rates of overdose, and I believe that should be enough. Um, we can expect to see greater access to healthcare as a whole because we're engaging people who don't engage with the healthcare system. People who use drugs don't generally engage with the healthcare system. Many of uh, people who use drugs don't have a physician, a primary care physician, and clinics are often the only interaction um, that's going on there. And so bringing people into the fold, there are just a lot of benefits that extend even beyond reductions in mortality that if we were to take similar approaches to those of countries that have been doing this and kind of get over our a little bit of our exceptionalism uh, with regards to drugs and to people who use them that we might be able to to enjoy. So thank you for sharing that and, and expanding on that there. Um, how could or should we um, leapfrog the current limitations to start with patient-centered um, opioid use disorder care in pharmacies in the U.S.? Well, I think that it's time to start talking about that, and it really isn't quite as complicated as a lot of folks might think. And it was discussed broadly at the recent methadone conference where Jeff and I interacted that it doesn't take an act of Congress to start offering methadone via pharmacies. It just takes a revision to some of the agencies that have been regulating these drugs. So you have the DEA, you have the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, and these agencies have power to change this, the landscape of this. Now, <clears throat> I'm one of <clears throat> often saying this doesn't happen to happen overnight. So this doesn't have to be the entire country offers methadone overnight in pharmacies and every primary care or any physician prescribes it. I think it would be quite easy to just take a single region, a single state, even a single city and start doing it. 
and look closely at the evidence. Are people staying in treatment? Are more people getting into treatment? Are rates of overdose per chance decreasing? Are rates of healthcare utilization per chance increasing? And we can start to build out a system in tandem to the one that currently exists because contrary to what some folks might say, which is that we should just completely dismantle the current system, I think that if we did that, we would be quite destabilizing to a lot of people who use drugs. You know, there are people who like the clinic system for whatever reason, and we can say that they shouldn't or that they have Stockholm syndrome or whatever, but there are a lot of patients who like it um, and they want to go to a clinic every day and they want to talk to a counselor. And so what business is of mine to say they should stop doing that? Um, and it's, I view it a lot like the bank system. You know, you have this cryptocurrency and all these types of online currency that are emerging in tandem to the current banking system. A lot of people believe that online currency is at some point going to replace all of that. I'm not sure. Uh, there are definite pluses there. There are definite aspects of attraction there to the consumer, to the person who holds money. And so we can build a tandem system that would probably be more effective, and it doesn't require fighting anyone, dismantling anyone, slamming anyone. You have doctors who have spent their entire lives prescribing methadone, and they've done a lot of good. Um, yes, there's been a lot of harm done, but there are physicians who do it well and know what they're doing. They know how to titrate somebody up and address their withdrawal symptoms. And we should deputize doctors who've been doing this for a very long time to train up emerging doctors and cultivate an attitude of wanting to treat this. I mean, we're talking about the leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 50. And if we if we can't treat the leading cause of death in general health care, then what can we do uh, as far as American health care? And so here we have an opportunity uh, to move forward in a humanistic manner. And I believe that we should. And you may have already touched on this, but I have to ask, um, what is the regimen for pharmacists and pharmacy students to do to support expanding methadone access? I would say we definitely need to empower and focus on people with lived and living experience. So you want to leverage people who have either been on methadone, have used drugs at some point in their life, know about the dynamic of criminalized drug use, because we have this war on drugs that's been going on for over 100 years now. We have a, you know third and fourth generations of people who have grown up with this as it stands. And people who are sort of standing on the outside of that or may not have been directly impacted are just not going to have the same capability of cultural transmission that people who have survived that drug war or people who have survived treatment um, who know all of the different nuances that accompany the struggle of a person who uses drugs to seek and access and succeed in treatment. And so I do think that we need to look at what people who use and have used drugs and who have been in treatment or are in treatment have to offer to that system in the same way that we're looking at the current physicians that are part of it and leverage that and build out systems that keep track of people in general that's not just going to give them a medication and say, see you later, but also isn't going to mandate and require all of these other things as a condition of services. So offer other things on an ancillary basis and make them optional to a person if they want them. Offer access to general health care and things to address a person's social determinants of health. And I'm not just saying that as a buzzword. I'm saying that to mean, let's look at the whole person because we know that out of the millions and millions of people who try an illicit drug at some point in their life, only 9 or 10% of them go on to develop a disorder. And so instead of focusing solely on the drug use, we should be asking ourselves what else is going on there. Um, and, and is it something that we could be taking a look at and, and benefiting our entire society, economy, uh, healthcare system, and culture by doing? That's fantastic advice, and I'm so happy we recorded this before. I'm actually giving a talk at a national pharmacy conference on, on Wednesday morning, and one of the thoughts is advocacy for pharmacists' role in medications for opioid use disorder, and I'm, I'll be sure to share some of your important points there. And every other talk I give, I'm hoping to 
also write a policy statement for one of the pharmacy organizations to firmly be committed to community access, community pharmacy access to, to methadone. So all of this fits in with a whole greater scheme of advocacy and a commentary and things like that. So very much appreciate all, everything you've shared and your, your valuable time outside of helping patients and all the things we talked about a little bit before uh, we started. Yeah, so thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me and the opportunity to discuss this. These are questions that I hope will continue to be in the public. The problem of opioid overdose is bigger than any one of us. And we need thinkers, we need brilliant minds, and we need pharmacists and, and healthcare providers on this topic and, and thinking about ways to address it. So thank you for creating that space and continuing to do so. Yes, this has been an incredible conversation. So once again, thank you to our incredible guest, Aaron, um, for joining us and providing expertise and insight throughout our conversation today. And we'll advertise this podcast on all of our socials. And I'm sure uh, Aaron will, might be willing to share uh, on his more extensive socials as well. And be sure to follow us at, at PharmD, P-H-A-R-M-D, Hub Health on Instagram and connect with us on LinkedIn. Turn on post notifications so you never miss an episode and smash that subscribe button now everywhere you get podcasts. That's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Amazon Music. Uh, and anywhere else you get those podcasts. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks.